Okay, welcome to the 60th episode of an Evolving Man podcast. Today I'm delighted to be speaking to Annabelle Gonzalez, MD, PhD. She works as a psychiatrist and psychotherapist in the public mental health system. She coordinates the trauma and dissociation program in the severe mental disorders services of the University Hospital of A Coruña and has a broad clinical experience with dissociative disorders and complex trauma. Trained in different psychotherapeutic approaches, she has been working with EMDR since 1999 and is an EMDR trainer. Annabelle is a vice president of the Spanish EMDR Association and she is the author of several articles, presentations and books. Okay, welcome Annabelle. Thank you, Piers. Mm, lovely to, to have you here. How I, I really love to begin the podcast is just for you to share a bit of your own journey. What drew you into this this work that you're now doing? Um, I started as a general psychiatrist when I uh, learned uh, this this area. And uh, after some years, I started uh, doing EMDR. And this was my first introduction to dissociation because my first patient <laughs> Uh, that I treated with EMDR had a dissociative disorder. I didn't realize that. And uh, I understood that I, I had to, to learn more about that. And I started doing uh, the ISSTD online course. That was my first training, specific training. And um, uh, sometime uh, after that, I was uh, working on some research on some books uh, more specialized about uh, EMDR dissociation, dissociative disorders. And this is my first book for general public. It, it's also for therapists, but many patients read it directly or people that are not patients. And it, it was an interesting experience. Yeah. So how to translate what we do in the in the therapy to in, in a in an easy to understand way to to everybody yeah mm, thank you thank you your book is is great to read there's so much information in there and looking at some of the reviews on amazon i'm not the only person to go wow it's really easy to understand uh, for it, it's thanks to my patience because it, it's the material at the beginning the idea was uh, writing the information we are using in the group therapy. We we have a group therapy for complex trauma patients. So we presented many uh, stories, uh, many um, uh, information, and they asked questions and we needed to change the way to explain it several times. And after it, we had this more integrated and digested material. So that's what was the first idea. But when we, I started writing it, I understood that it can be a, a book in itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's it's made of my ideas and it's made of the questions of my patients about my ideas. So it was an interactive work. Mm, thank you. And it really works. I was filming a couple of weeks ago on London, on, on Waterloo Bridge. And the idea of it's okay to make mistakes, purposely making mistakes, because I was really nervous. I was really frightened. And I was like, oh, I remember Dr. Uh, Annabelle's teaching. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to make mistakes now. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, making mistakes is a, a good way of learning. It, it's the only way, really. Mm, yeah. Mm, mm, failing mm. and learning from it and failing again. And, mm. and that's life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's interesting, I was so frightened of making mistakes. And this is a very common theme with my clients, uh, ex-boarders, it's this fear of not making any mistakes. So they rarely step outside of their comfort zone, especially around intimacy. Yeah, and, and it has to do, in my opinion, with attachment and the capacity of uh, exploration, because attachment is not only the response to separation, it's also the capacity of exploring from the secure base. Mm -hmm. So many of our patients with complex trauma don't have this capacity. They are afraid of doing new things. They are afraid of moving outside their problems. Um, and doing new things um, 
uh, has uh, this this uh, thing of mistakes included, it, it, we cannot avoid that. So in the groups, we start in the first sessions, uh, the session with the uh, contest of the um, better mistake of the week. Uh, we, yeah. we have a competition between them yeah. uh, with their mistakes. The mistake we learn the most, it's the better. Yeah? <laughs> So that's that's the idea because otherwise they don't try new things, mm -hmm. and uh, for me it's very important not only working things into the therapeutic sessions but also moving things and changing things outside. Yeah, and at the beginning in the groups we we didn't emphasize this as much as we do now, mm -hmm. because we we try to to work into the the therapy, but patients. Mm, didn't move yeah mm -hmm. they they understood they they thought it makes sense but they didn't move to any direction so uh, we need to do things to help them to act and to change and to explore uh, new possibilities mm -hmm. and of course making mistakes is part of it yeah yeah thank you thank you thank you I'd love for us to explore the, the foundations, what you see as the difference between trauma and complex trauma. Yeah. Uh, a trauma, it's, um, for, for me, it's a blockage. It's something that happened at a moment and uh, block the, 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 the system and blocks our capacity to process and digest that experience. But complex trauma, it's, uh, something that happens for so such a long time mm -hmm. that creates a pattern, a way of functioning. So it uh, influences the way we take care of ourselves. It influences our emotional regulation style. It influences how we relate with other people. So it changes our functioning. That's why the treatment is different because with uh, with EMDR we, we we have procedures very clear and specific for working with a blockage point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we we have experience a very hard experience that happens once, and we can unblock the system very powerfully. But with complex trauma, we need to do a, a more continuous work on self care, emotional regulation, relationships. Otherwise. And blocking the system is not enough because the system itself is functioning in a disturbed way. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. As I was sharing before we, we started recording, as I was reading your book, I could see so many similarities within myself. I went to boarding school from age 11 through to age 18. And so many of my clients, some have been at age five. Uh, to boarding school and as I was reading it, it's like yeah this idea of self-care you know which is such an important part of what I teach is that was kind of the thing that I wasn't doing when I was in my 20s just drinking didn't have any interest and when I started to do self-care that was a real big shift for me um, so I could resonate so much with with your book yeah, uh, or sometimes you need to learn to, to be self-reliant mm. excessively because you didn't have a, an internal image, an internal model of how to self-soothe, self-care. Self, yeah, it, 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 you don't have a model, so you need to do uh, by yourself. And yeah, mm. and in other cases, the model uh, can be. Uh, even worse if you had experiences with uh, teachers or, or sometimes with parents who are very aggressive or hostile um, because you internalize this model. So when you are feeling bad, for example, you self-blame to yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is also self-care in my opinion. Right? The, the way you uh, behave you with yourself, the way you um uh talk to yourself the way you act when you have problems and sometimes we don't act in our benefit sometimes we are our worst enemy mm -hmm. uh, and in the 
first time in the in the difficult times it's even worse yeah mm. and this is something we learn in in some way, somewhere uh, that we, we need to we, we don't know how to take care of ourselves uh, as an in, in instinctive uh, issue it's something we need to learn uh, somewhere and then uh, going to a boarding school with uh, five year old you said mm -hmm. you know, it's it's very soon it's it's mm -hmm. It's it's quite difficult. Uh, a, a school is is um, is a place where we can learn um, information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. but w uh, as children, we need to learn many other things. Mm -hmm. We need to learn about emotions. We need to to uh, learn about what uh, self care is. Mm -hmm. We need to learn uh, how to relate to other people. And the things that happen at the school needs to be mm, talked to to somebody who who cares about that. Uh, we need to go home and tell uh, our parents what happened, and they they can uh, encourage us or they can uh, hug us if it's necessary. And this is part of the learning. It's not only the subjects uh, at the school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm, mm, mm. yeah thank you thank you and as you say that yes I, I learned information myself and my clients but that self-care I didn't learn and the emotional any emotion that we've shown tears or anger it didn't have to be me but we often were living I was living in an open dormitory so there was no doors not until I was 16 um, so very little privacy. So if I showed emotions in those first few weeks, people, I can remember the whole dormitory coming in one day when I was crying and laughing at me, like 30 boys. After that, I said, I'm never going to do that again. Um, and learning that you cannot show your emotions, it's a problem for, mm -hmm. for regulating them. Yeah. Yeah, because emotional regulation is not only something interested, psychic, it's something that... Uh, happens in relationships mm -hmm. so we need to um, to have someone there to do that it's not only a, a private thing yeah. Yeah. so yeah i i think that it has to be different depending on how the boarding school is is working i don't know if uh, uh, children go their homes in um, in the weekend or they are for long periods of time in the boarding school it depends. Some I've heard have stayed there for a year without going home. They just go whole home. year without going home. Summer. Wow. So when I was 11, I think I saw my parents on my first term. I saw them for five days between uh, January through to July. Mm -hmm. When I was 11. Other, I think nowadays, I think it's it can be weekly boarding, but it's often frowned upon. Certainly in the UK, if you're a weekly boarder, everyone else is, uh, uh, you know, a term, you know, every three weeks they can go home. It's almost like they're seen as less, less than. So often those kids want to become full time boarders. Um, yeah. So there are some schools which are weekly, um, but often those people that I've worked with, you know, probably go home every th three weeks. And those who are living abroad, it's it's even longer. So, boarding schools were um, quite frequent here um, some decades ago, not now. Mm -hmm. And we have many patients with those kind of experiences and many traumatic experiences because of uh, the isolation, the loneliness, mm -hmm. the difficulties in a sometimes hostile environment even if the teachers uh, try to to do things right um it's like the army in a way mm -hmm. yeah do you have rules do you need to follow some general instructions and uh, it's not so easy to adapt to the specific characteristics of the child mm -hmm. the, the children are very different and in a family you know your children you know the, the different um siblings and with each one of them you can be a little bit more um, 
um, more under um, I, I don't know the word sorry mm -hmm. but but you can adapt uh, dual behavior to the specific needs of each child it's difficult when there are a lot of children and we know that uh, the children who grow up in orphanages with um, foster uh, people taking care of them don't have the same good experience as when they have a family mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. uh the, the the cortisol levels are mm -hmm. high many times because things happen at the school you have difficulties with a subject with a, a colleague with a teacher and you you don't have a person who can take care of, of you so uh, I, I treat many patients with difficulties coming from that kind of environments. The only exception is when things at home at home were very adverse and very problematic. In that case, for children being in the board school, it's a, a lucky thing. But if you had parents, quite good parents, uh, being separate from them, uh, it, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'd love you to explore, Annabelle, about this idea of attachment. You know, talk about this in the book. What is it and what's the importance of having secure attachment in childhood? You've explained a bit, but yeah. Uh, it's um, a source of reliance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a secure uh, attachment, you will feel security inside. And with security inside, everything is easier. And even if things become difficult, uh, you have a kind of a strength. Mm -hmm. You know that uh, things can be overcome. Uh, you know that you have resources to deal with them. And if you don't, you can um, go to other people and search for help. And it's easy for you. Mm -hmm. You don't need people all the time. In this case, you will have a preoccupied attachment, so you are not dependent on others, but you are not all pathologically independent. Mm -hmm. So you can have both possibilities, self-care and being cared by others. So uh, things are, are easier from this point of view. And the secure attachment gives you the capacity of reflection. So, and with a good reflective capacity, you can analyze the situations and you can search for solutions. You can choose the best option. And if you fail, you don't care. You can learn from that and do new things. And yeah, uh, with a insecure attachment, you will be more rigid. Mm -hmm. You will be have all time the same. It doesn't matter which kind of situation you have in front of you. And uh, maybe you can be more dependent on others and you don't want to have autonomy. You want to uh, have the possibility of doing things by yourself or the opposite. You will be pathologically independent, self-reliant, and you never ever will search for help from others. So there are some moments in life when you need to do that and you can't. So, and the more problematic um, style is disorganized attachment you want to have a strategy to um, deal with things uh, for relationships with other people you you will be chaotic in your way of, of functioning in many aspects so it's it's a serious problem and it's the more related to uh, style uh, related to pathology mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. When you say patho patho pathologically independent, it's like, yeah. yeah, I see that in myself and in so many of the ex-boarders that I know is yeah. I'll do everything on my own, you know? Yeah. And, and I, it's an adaptation mechanism, mm -hmm. but it's not good. It's, it's good for surviving, but it's not good for living. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 de definitely. I, 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 When I got to that point, when I asked, started to ask for help, then, yeah, I, I can remember that that was a real breakthrough, that people actually being there and helping and supporting. 
Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you. So th the other aspect you talk about in your book is dissociation. And mm -hmm. can you explain why dissociation happens with trauma, especially complex trauma? Um, there are many, many definitions of dissociation, many different concepts. Mm -hmm. um, but we have uh, mostly two types. One is uh, disconnection, mm -hmm. uh, detachment, uh, and you are not connected with your emotion, with your experience, with your feelings that you are, but at the same time you aren't in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you don't have indicators of what is happening, what do you need, what other people are doing, if they are dangerous or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't have good information. And the other aspect is uh, compartmentalization, fragmentation of the personality. Mm -hmm. There are many things that you cannot um, put together. For example, there are aspects of yourself that you reject or you don't want to see. Uh, and they are acting, they are there, but they are acting outside your um, awareness. Yeah. For example, it's very typical with people suffering from violent situations in childhood that they reject their own rage, their, their own anger. And they put their anger outside. They don't want to uh, be angry in 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 in, uh, in their daily life but of course many people makes you feel anger so this anger is like put in a close space outside my awareness but they are there yeah those feelings are there and uh, sometimes i um, become angry with, uh, with myself or uh, i have outbursts of rage because i have so many anger there that uh, sometimes it explodes and I feel really really bad because I behave in the way I don't want to yeah I, I'm similar to my father or my mother or the person who was violent and this is the last thing I want to be so uh, it creates a very contradictory way of functioning and it's complex inside and it can be complex uh, also in relationships in the way I connect with others. Sometimes I am very, very, very needed and sometimes I reject them and I'm very contradictory. And dissociation is uh, fundamentally contradiction and it comes from very contradictory environments. For example, if, if I have a, a caregiver that is very contradictory or I have two caregivers that are very, very different, some, one of them is very hostile and the other one is very victimized, I have two models, two incompatible models in my mind and the two of them are active in a way. I, maybe I identify myself more with, with that one or maybe I identify myself more with this one. And it, depending on that, I, I develop my identity, but it's not a um, it very integrated identity. I feel different uh, sometimes. I feel that it's not me, the one who is feeling, the one who is acting. I, I don't feel com myself complete, a complete person. I'm fragmented. I'm, uh, I have this contradiction inside of me. Mm -hmm. mm, thank you. So disconnection and compartmentalization. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I can really resonate with the rage. That was something I really struggled with as a young child to often fight with my father, which I was told by my family is part of the reason I went to boarding school. Yeah. Then I learned to suppress it. And then it would come out in my 20s, these bouts once a year, never towards anyone else. It was always towards myself. And then it became self-harming and suicidal attempts. And I could really feel that rage within me, that battle, that inner battle. Yeah. What, what can we do? Because I, I see this again. I see this with a lot of ex-boarders, people who've been through trauma. Is this compartmentalization, this dissociation? 
and they just can't feel their emotions. They can't connect to them. And I have my kind of ways of, of, of dealing. Sometimes it really helps and gets into the emotions again. But some, it's almost like the, the lines cut between emotions and the thoughts. And you talk about it a bit in the book. What do you teach people? What do you say? Uh, the first thing is understanding that we are disconnected because the disconnected people is not aware of that. Sometimes they think mm -hmm. they, they are okay or, or that it's a good way of functioning. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is understanding that we are really disconnected and that this is not good for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the second thing is um, learning how to change it. So uh, a person who is disconnected um for for a person who is disconnected to be connected is not a good thing mm -hmm. yeah it's suffering it's pain it's yeah so we need to explain what they can win by being more connected they will be more strong they will be more protected they will feel the life in a deep in a deeper way uh and they can be more um uh better with other people they, they they can have more possibilities in relationship because without our emotions we cannot understand other people yeah. right? or we cannot calculate how close we need to be uh from them or how how much we need to protect from them so if they understand how things can change and why it's good for them to do the change then we can start step by step. But it, this is not something, the, the, the line is not there and we need to create the connection yeah, little by little. I think um, one possibility is through the therapeutic relationship, if the therapist can understand what is underlying, what's the uh, emotion that can be here, they have the possibility of recognize it in themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah? Without a cue, without uh, someone who can help them, it's it's more difficult. Sometimes a friend, sometimes a couple, or sometimes other people can help us. And sometimes the animals can help us. Yeah, Because I, I think people with uh, um, a severe disconnection can connect with animals mm -hmm. easily because they need that connection, but they cannot allow themselves to be connected with a person. They, they learn not to be connected with people, but animals are different. Mm -hmm. So we don't have so many defenses and we can, we, th this can be the first connection. Thank you. Someone was pointing out in the UK about animals is, is that a reason why in, britain we have such a <laughs> adoration of dogs because we've disassociated you know we have this thing in the uk called stiff upper lip we don't yeah. show emotions boys don't cry you know it's it's weak so could that be why we have this <gasps> adoration <laughs> of dogs i've never animals? thought that yeah 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 amazing yeah because i i think as a child i loved animals you know um and that i think yeah devastated me when i went to boarding school my dog died wow like i felt guilty i'd abandoned her, i left her uh and uh, that that breaking of attachment really so we talked quite a bit about it about boarding school but i would love for you just as a psychiatrist the question was who specializes in trauma attachment dissociation what is your clinical assessment of boarding school about separating children? Um, I think uh, separation affects uh, attachment. Yeah, it's it's one of the of the things we explore when we analyze the style of attachment of a person, uh, how uh, they reacted with separations. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes it brokens the something inside. Yeah. If the separation is for a long time, uh, I think it can 
uh, it, it, the, the children needs to adapt to the new, new environment. And it's not um, a warm environment, I think, in the majority of the cases. So uh, you need to learn to survive. And, and I think that this is the main problem. Um, in family, you, you learn how to lie, live, but you don't need to learn how to survive in your family, uh, only in cases when family is, is a, a hostile environment that sometimes unfortunately happens. Yeah? But uh, outside your family, you need to survive. And a children is not um, prepared to survive by itself. Yeah, uh, a children needs to um, live with someone who protects them, to, who take care of them until they are completely developed. And it doesn't happen until we are 22 or 25 years old. When we are an older adolescent in, uh, in our 80s or uh, 20s, yeah, we, we can do things and we can have autonomy, but we still need our parents, yeah? And I think this is not because I'm a Spanish, I think it's the definition of, of attachment, yeah? Uh, the, the human beings are um, connected with our uh, parents for a long period of time, mm -hmm. and it's biology, yeah? We, we really need that connection to develop our minds, to develop our capacity of regulate our emotions, to be more autonomous, uh, the children need uh, needs to learn autonomy, but at the adequate age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they they are becoming more and more autonomous when they are getting older, but not very young. Five year old is is uh, uh, is not an age for being separate from your parents for for sure. Yeah, and uh, with uh, higher age in your 50s or or more maybe you can be some period separate from your parents but with a connection for example going home uh, during the weekends can be enough in a, for an adolescent but not for a younger children yeah mm -hmm. but, but being separate for months it's crazy in both cases for mm -hmm. children for adolescents because you don't have the support of the caregiver. Even if you talk uh, uh, with them regularly, it's not the same. And for example, um, children who are not in a boarding in school and they, for example, they suffer bullying at school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, The problem with bullying is not a school problem. The problem with bullying is a, is a family problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Because it's something that happens at the school, but the the, the issue that the thing we we used to ask in those kinds kind of situations is what happened with your family when this happened at the school did you told your parents about that what they did how they reacted uh, did they believe you they uh, did they support you or they didn't yeah that's the important thing because if you have this support from the family things that happen at the school are not so difficult. Mm -hmm. Or we have studies when a, a children is doing a math um, task at home, alone or, or with the support of a parent, the children who do the, the math uh, exercise with the support of the mother mm -hmm. had lower uh, levels of cortisol. Yeah, and we know that higher level of cortisol are, are toxic for the brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a, a continuous stress is toxic for the brain, and so we, and we know that the brains of people with uh, um, a stressful, a continuous stressful situation are affected. I I don't know. Uh, I really didn't review uh, this boarding school issue in in a very deep way. But as I said, in Spain, we have experience with many people of other generations uh, going to board in schools and with many um, problems uh, generated by that. Mm, thank you. Yeah, it's, 
for me it's obviously a fascinating area yeah in schools and I think I've it's got more fascinating recently because I've just started to understand how many in the UK but also globally have been to boarding school um, if you look at Elon Musk Mark Zuckerberg um, Donald Trump these people have been to boarding school. Uh, Boris Johnson, the current prime minister, 70%, 60% of high court judges, the head of the BBC, Channel 4, all have been to boarding school. And I question, what might the impact be uh, on them? Maybe without a boarding school, the history of the humanity would be different. Yeah, you know, and yeah. th there's a, an amazing book, um, by the psychotherapist Nick Duffel called Wounded Leaders. And he talks about this in there. And it's like, oh my God, of course, yeah. What might be? So what might be the impact of having so many of our leaders having been to, to boarding school? You know, maybe it was good for them, but if it wasn't, what might the impact be on society? You know, we can see the impact on families, but I'm just wondering on this larger level, you know, I think in the UK, 50% of the main head journalists are boarding school, you know? And you're like, ah, so it's filtered through this model. So, yeah. yeah. And, and sometimes these kind of situations, uh makes people to develop symptoms, but sometimes they they don't develop symptoms, but they mm, function in, in a specific way, maybe less connected uh, to other people, feelings, or, yeah, because uh, you live all your entire life in a survival model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... And and probably the your interest or your um, goals in life would be different. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, in in a school you need to establish uh, more competition with other schoolmates, and um, yeah, you need to survive the teachers. You need to win. You need to compete. Yeah, in the family this happens with your siblings. Yeah, it's very useful to come, but but it's uh, um, not it's not so many people. <laughs> your your siblings are less people, but but you have your parents there to to mediate and to take care of the relationships in between their the siblings. But we don't know. It's curious. I didn't know that data about uh, how many people was in boarding in schools were in boarding in schools. Uh, in politics or other professions yeah it's it's fascinating elon musk mentioned that he was thrown down the stairs when he was at boarding school he was hospitalized and bullied really badly um you know so a lot of these i think uh boris johnson when in his prep school there was sexual abuse going on uh, wow. richard branson boarding school he was sexually abused the first day at boarding school so when we look, we're going, wow, do we have a group of wounded leaders, traumatized leaders? And what might the impact be? I mean, in the UK, we're struggling with the cost of living crisis with, um, you know, while the rich are getting richer. And so, yeah, so I, I'm fascinated by it myself. So this is I've started to make a documentary about this idea. And there are there are some traumatic situations that may happen in boarding schools, like bullying or abuse or things like that. And the children is less um, supported and protected by the family. But uh, I think it's also interesting the the relevance of neglect, the mm -hmm. absence of uh, yeah, it's not something that happens, but it's uh, that thing that has to happen, but don't happen yeah uh there is uh, moments when i need uh to talk to someone and there is nobody there it's it's my friend but it's not the same it's not an adult who can protect me and um 
this lack of uh, love or uh, warming or care it's uh, it's very damaging yeah and in, in some comparative studies the impact of neglect is sometimes higher than the impact of abuse yeah yeah yeah, yeah. thank you yeah I, I did read that in nick's book um, wounded leaders saying about neglect because yeah. neglect doesn't have a beginning and an end it's just all the yeah. time i remember reading my book uh, my my book my uh, my diary from boarding school that first year the word i used the most was boring i was just bored all the time and for me that was what i was saying is neglect i was just there was no yeah. one no joy there nothing yeah yeah and um, dealing with that is sometimes di more difficult because it's not something it's the absence of you don't know what mm. yeah and it's something you don't know in the boarding school you do have the experience of the previous stage the previous period when you did have someone there mm. and and when this uh is not there anymore you can notice how difficult it is uh the, the effect of neglect when you are very very young it's worse because you sometimes don't remember how things were before mm -hmm. yeah. and it, to develop in this kind of environment and it's it's even more difficult mm. thank you that brings up a question I had reading your book over the weekend, this idea of neglect, but also if we can't remember, quite a lot of people, even going to boarding school age eight, can't remember their memories. I had a, a men's circle a couple of weeks ago where it was, it was called the stories we don't remember. And what we did was just shared some of our stories and that helped other men go, Oh, I hadn't even thought of that. Totally forgotten. What do you suggest for people who can't remember memories or they had this neglect? What can we, we do to start healing that? For people who don't remember mm. the previous stage, you, you mean? Not uh, necessarily the previous stage, but, you know, some don't remember the previous stage. Yeah. Even the boarding school. People can't remember boarding school. What happened? they don't remember the, the, our mind tried to protect us mm -hmm. from pain mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes you don't remember a specific period of time or you don't remember some situations you lived there because they are very painful mm -hmm. yeah but um if you start connecting more with yourself with time those memories will come I think we 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 it's it's not good for us to force ourselves to remember. Yeah, okay. yeah. Because if our brain is not giving us the information, it's because we are not prepared for it in a way. Mm -hmm. When when people just work on connection, on self-care, on changes internally and in relationships, the memories I think that they come by themselves spontaneously. It, it's my experience mm -hmm. and if you try to force it and to go there and try to remember it's it, in a way this is not a good, a good way of treating yourself because you are forcing yourself mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and if you have learned that when you don't want to do something other people was forcing your, were forcing yourself doing the same now is not a good idea mm -hmm. yeah so uh, the, the the thing is changing the way we uh, treat ourselves. Sometimes it's more complex because we have really dissociated memories and there is a part of us containing that memories. And in a way, we need to recover the, the access to that part. But in this case, I, I think it has to be through a psychotherapeutic process. It's, it's not something we can do alone. Yeah. And if we try to do it alone, it's because we needed to survive alone. <laughs> and we are trying to do the same now. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, I can relate to that about, I think, uh, part of my journey is I, I was working finan in the financial sector in London in banking and uh, sales, and I had a breakdown and ended up in a Buddhist monastery. And I started to work with a Jungian analyst and other psychotherapists. And while I was there, I re started to reconnect with my emotions. And it was a very early memory, probably one or two. And one day I just connected to it and I was in such grief and crying and crying and crying. And I hadn't cried for 15 years before that, not even at friends' funerals or my father's funeral. And that opened the floodgates for the next couple of years. I would cry on a daily basis. Uh, yeah. And when you start crying, you, you can understand why you couldn't connect with that previously yeah. because it was too much. But when we are disconnected, we think that connecting is easy. Yeah. yeah but it's yeah. not. It's, it's <laughs> not. It's not. And it comes when it uh, our brain, our inside understand that we can yeah it, it has uh, its time mm -hmm. yeah. would you say it's with something like complex trauma it's something which it takes time because some i know yeah. that judith herman in her book trauma and recovery says it's an ongoing process and i yeah. notice sometimes with people with complex trauma it's like right i want it done in a week or yeah yeah weeks, and you're like mm. Be patient, please. <laughs> yeah, when someone calls me and say, oh, I want to do EMDR because it cures two in six sessions, I know that person is complex trauma for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. interesting. Yeah, because you, you want magic solutions. Yeah, you are not reflecting about how many uh, aspects you need to work with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So what do you suggest to them? They they come to you and they're like, right, you can help me in five sessions, six sessions. Yeah, to kind of start talking with, with that person uh, because after one hour, hour explaining how many things we need to work with, it's very clear that it's not possible in six sessions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um uh, I think that we were talking about some minutes uh, before about a safe attachment, about secure attachment. And uh, it has to do with reflection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And learning to reflect in a very deep way about myself, my situation, about my relationship takes time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a learning. Yeah. It's, it's not following some rules, some guidelines and doing abc yeah it's to explore and to understand and and it has to take time it's like learning a, la a new language mm -hmm. yeah. i loved your example thank you in the book of the bike oh that was brilliant. yeah yeah that's a fantastic example and it's a good video D did you watch it no i didn't see the video yeah. so it's, it's for it I, I recommend it to all my patients and my the therapists uh, that i i am teaching uh, it's the bicycle backwards mm -hmm. from this test in Sandley, and it explains how this man can ride a bike that uh, works the opposite and normally it, it it turns this way to the right and this way to the left so the opposite and normal and how mm -hmm. can uh he he can do that so of course making a lot of mistakes yeah falling off from the bike once and again one day the other day all time until uh, after eight months mm -hmm. five minutes each day so it's not a, a, a lot of time but it's every day every day falling off from the bike every day five minutes and after that time he he can ride a bike yeah and it explains how things change in the in complex trauma it takes time it's not a lot of uh, time every day but it's a lot of repetitions yeah every every day 
And for me, it's a good metaphor. And for my patients, it's very interesting to see it. Mm -hmm. they, they can understand many things about uh, how we function. And uh, another element that is very useful for them is the idea of the automatic functioning. My mind is programmed to function in a very automatic way. Mm -hmm. And I can understand the change I need to do but my mind is doing things automatically. So I need to work on this automatic mechanism. I need to turn the, this automatic to my manual and to start to do things with more consciousness, with more awareness, and to change small things. For example, if I, I don't move, I am quite paralyzed, there are many things I need to do and I, I can't. Mm. The issue is to move a millimeter. Yeah. I don't care which kind of change or in that direction. It's to move a millimeter because if I do that, I'm not really paralyzed. But if I try to do the entire thing and I can't, I'm reinforcing the, paral the paralysis. Mm. So the small things change this automatic functioning but it has to be a small thing in the exact point where the automatic pattern is it's working could you give an example of one of an automatic pattern there annabelle um for example i i cannot go outside home hmm. yeah um, I try to go for a walk, but I always uh, find excuses in my mind. I can do that. Uh, for example, with some of the patients the other day in the group, we programmed uh, an idea that was going downstairs and upstairs. Don't go outside, but just go out to your home, go downstairs, go upstairs. That's all. But you are not in front of the door trying to go outside yeah and if you can't go downstairs go outside and come in but try to do a movement that that's one example yeah or uh, i cannot wake up in the morning and i can put just a sock i i don't mm, dress get dressed com completely but i put something yeah, put on a sock, and the next um, at the next moment, I try to wake up. I put a shirt, and I try to to move a little bit. Uh, small, teeny things. Mm. Mm. Thank you. That's yeah. That's great. Or I I can't uh, talk to other people about how I feel. Mm. Okay, don't do that. But just say one phrase, one phrase saying, I feel not very good today, nothing else. You don't need to start a conversation, but try to introduce one phrase mm. with I feel, just one. yeah. Or I can't uh, tell people how I feel, okay, but as you are not uh, talking to anybody, you can send a message to a colleague or a friend asking that person how they feel mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not the entire thing but it's something in that direction mm -hmm. and it has to be specific to the point where the patient is yeah? for example with some patients the exercise is making mistakes in itself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah when we explain this thing we need to make a lot of mistakes and they say oh they say okay this is an exercise for you you need to make a mistake every day yeah. Mm -hmm. And they say, oh, but I make a lot of mistakes. Okay, but they are not on purpose. You need to make mistakes on purpose. And it, it if it can be something a little bit crazy and funny, it's it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can put the underwear on the reverse, or you can use socks from different colors, or you can okay, only one earring. It doesn't matter, or uh, just uh, arrive one minute late, just one minute, but try to not to be absolutely punctual, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they really try, they can start laughing of mistakes. That's a good moment. Mm, yeah, 
that's wonderful. Yeah, I read in the book and I was wondering about examples of mistakes, what we could yeah. do. So I love those, putting the underwear on backwards or wrong socks. I'm going to try that tomorrow. I'll put, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, uh, put socks, wrong socks on. Yeah, if you dedicate your mind up, which kind of crazy mistake can I make today? Mm. Yeah, Things yeah. are changing because you are approaching the idea of making mistakes in a different way. Yeah. And I think, thank you. That's one of the things my wife has said about me. And I notice very common for ex-boarders and people with complex trauma is control, trying to be yeah. in control all the time. And especially if I'm a bit stressed, like last night, finishing holiday, and I'm thinking, oh, I've got two podcasts a day, plus a meeting with the film. Uh, and it's that, oh, and I just know I have to just breathe. I do um, EFT, so I do the tapping. And it's like, oh, yeah, relax. Um, yeah. So I can <laughs> I really notice that. Yeah, control is um, substitute for security. Mm. Yeah, when when we don't have access to security, to internal security, uh, the only thing we can use is control. Yeah, mm. and many many people with uh, attachment problems, and I think that boarding schools can can function as a a broken in the attachment connection mm. with the with the caregivers. Uh, may may um, create this tendency to, to control and we can feel control by doing things yeah uh, this this kind of rituals or things like that or trying to control our thoughts or our feelings or or sometimes uh, taking care of other people yeah taking care sometimes is a way of feeling some something similar to to security yeah but it's a kind of compulsive uh, caregiving is as I, I need to take care of people it's the only role where i feel secure or sometimes domination or submission yeah when i am in relationships that are uh, dominant or um or of i can dominate other people i or i can be the dominated one uh, i can feel something similar to control uh, but it's it's problematic because control doesn't function all time. There are many unpredictable situations that I won't be able to control, and this at uh, this time will be very uh, upset. This happened with the pandemic. It was something that we couldn't control. So people who was were prone to control uh, was. <laughs> Uh, have difficulties with with the pandemic time and um really uh, if i can uh, if i only can function through uh, taking care of other people or dominate people or or being dominated of course my relationships won't be uh, won't be good for me mm-hmm. yeah if I take care of other people all the time, I will be exhausted. Uh, I won't uh, take care of myself in the same mm-hmm. level. Or if I only can relate with all people who are um, submissive to me, um, if they rebel against me, <laughs> I will have a problem. And of course, I won't have um, good relationships. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. I, I will become a politician or something like that. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting as you we're speaking about control, you know, the last few years has seen us become very controlled on one level. And, yeah. And it's like, ah, and as I understand more about trauma and reading beneath the surface, it's like, is this a sub, you know, like a symptom of they're trying to be very controlled, not on purpose, but it's their unconscious programs, which are, we've got to control everything. Yeah. And, yeah. and sometimes uh, something we do to re- recover mm. a kind of control is um, um, defending ideas in a very strong way. Mm. I, I was 
wonder why uh, during the pandemic uh, there was um, the, the I, I don't know how to explain that this uh, obsession for um, fixed ideas mm -hmm. yeah for example in social media there are many people defending against vaccines pro vaccines um the 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 earth is plain or this kind of of ideas and defending them very very uh hard and i i think it's caused uh by the uncertainty and the difficulties for dealing with this chaos that was the pandemic time yeah. and i try to uh, get some conviction about something uh, to recover some control mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so if uh, everything was caused by uh, an evil entity things make sense mm -hmm. and for i uh, recover a kind of control or but it, it can be with the pandemic or it can be with with everything yeah some ideologies this radical way of uh, approaching things that we are experiencing in general in society. I think it's a side effect of the uncertainty of the of the pandemic in a way. Mm -hmm. We need to feel that we that something is clear yeah. in the middle of this situation. Yeah, yeah. Even if it's a crazy thing, it, it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. Yeah, which is interesting in Buddhism, one of the key teachings is anicca, uncertainty. It's like, well, it's just uncertain. You know, it's not yeah. sure. Things will change. And I found that. Yeah. And this, yeah. for example, we were talking about attachment. When you have a, a secure autonomous attachment, you feel security in the middle of a pandemic or in the middle of a crazy situation. You feel something inside that helps you to go through the situation. Mm -hmm. Of course, things affect you. Of course, you can um, have bad times, but there is some strength inside. Mm -hmm. And this is something that grows inside of you if you have the secure base of a relationship with a caregiver that is there for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm how do we so if we're kind of segueing into some solutions here how do we start to develop if we had an insecure attachment if we had complex we've got complex trauma how yeah. do we segue into cultivating that inner strength healing I think, yeah I, I think one a very very important point is reflecting mm -hmm. yeah secure attachment is more related to um, the reflective capacity mm -hmm. and also the, the capacity uh, for trusting others. Mm -hmm. So you need to explore your inner world, you need to understand your mind and others' mind and for that you need to uh, be receptive to other people's perspectives, think about them, uh, ask yourself questions don't care about the answers just ask questions but uh, really with uh, with curiosity trying to understand not blaming yourself because sometimes the questions are not questions mm -hmm. yeah are um, self attack in a way you know? why this happened why i do that why i don't do that yeah this the, those are not questions mm -hmm. i'm meaning i i want to what I want to explain is that we need to, to feel some curiosity about how our mind function, how other people function. And this way we can start exploring uh, many, many aspects. We need to, to be more flexible. If we have some rigid ways of thinking or behaving, that's not good because the reality is very, very different at different moments. So we need to uh, adapt these realities and uh, to understand what happened, what happened there, 
in that place or what's happening here and to, to, to do different things at different moments. So th this is one thing. And, uh, and for that, we need to forget our convictions, our beliefs, our ideas, and be um, be prone to change them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe uh, I think that I can't trust anybody, mm -hmm. but this is a, a belief. This is not a reality. I feel that because maybe some people in my life betrayed me or they were doing bad things to me, but other people can be nice and I I can't uh, know them if I don't trust a little bit, if, if I don't try, yeah? Mm -hmm. So I need to recover this capacity for exploring, making mistakes, doing different things. Uh, they are not magic solutions. They mm -hmm. are just experiments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we need to re-experiment the life and try with uh, every new person in a new way. Yeah. Because the new person I am knowing now, uh, they are not uh, guilty of the things that I suffered in the past. They are new people. Yeah. So this idea. I think is the basis for the change, and uh, but it's difficult, I, uh, and it's also important to understand why it's so difficult. Yeah, because the question of control, for example, in in the place where I am, I feel a little bit of control. And exploring new things means a little bit of fear, and I need to to be with my fear doing those things. And if I do very, very small things, the fear is not a lot. If I try uh, the, the, uh, a very big thing, of course, it can be difficult. But small things every day. I think that the image of the bicycle is the image of the change. Yeah. Five minutes every day. This is the only thing we need. But every day. Because otherwise it will be more time yeah so every day five minutes it doesn't matter what we try but something different just something different yeah mm -hmm. and if i know what's my problem for example my problem is that i am not aware of my feelings mm -hmm. many people told me uh that i i don't resonate in many situations or i i don't seem to feel what other people feels so in that case, my exercise can be as easy as stopping for a minute to be aware of how I breathe, how I feel inside, pay attention to the inside of my body for one minute a day. Everybody can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we don't stop even a minute a day. Mm -hmm. We don't stop to look inside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I try with this. I try with this. Every day, one minute, and we'll see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, mm, if we think in this way, it, it can be easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the question is that if we don't remind ourselves that it's important, we are going to forget it, and the inertia will take us uh, back in our previous way of functioning. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I see that. Um, it's a big key with the work I do with people is having a daily practice. I yeah, fifteen minutes. Um, mine myself is about two and a half hours, but I don't oh. suggest to people to do that. Um, but I just you know because I get so much out of it. But I see that that it starts to rewire the brain. And yeah. after months, people are like, feel so much better. And you're like, keep going. What sometimes they do is, no, no, I feel better. I'll stop it. It's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> back, like you say, you go back into that inertia again. And yeah. in order for us to change. Yeah, yeah rewiring the brain takes time. Mm. We need to create a new connection and reinforce it mm. a lot of times. Yeah. Mm. And after some months sometimes it starts to be 
more strong. Mm, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So I think we've asked, I've made quite a lot of the questions I think you've answered here. Um, yeah, I guess my my last question is really how do people find more about your work or your books? I put a link in the description to your books, uh, especially this one. I really recommend It's Not Me. It's a really beautiful book, very heart opening and so resonating for me as an ex-boarder going, you know, I've got I made three pages of notes and I could probably read quite a few quotes. We probably could talk for another few hours. Uh, I was like yeah that's really important yeah that um saying dissociative symptoms there may be both marked personality changes as well as rigid control of emotions and behavior as part of dissociative so many things in here so I really recommend people reach out how do people find out more about your work or your books uh, they can find them uh, in, on my website. It's anabelgonzalez.es. Mm -hmm. um, there are some materials that are translated to English, not many of them. I have other books for general population, but are still uh, in Spanish and other languages, but still not in in English. But there are some materials and some videos in the website. Um, and there are other books that are translated to English, but they are professional books. Um, mostly for EMDR practitioners and mm -hmm. yes I did look at the interview uh, about EMDR on YouTube um, which yeah. I kind of watched so what I'll do is I'll put a link to your website into the description and people want to read articles um, but yeah I really thank you for your work it's really inspiring that there's someone out there i felt really understood listening to you today but also reading your book so i really thank you so much for your work thank and you I... Piers. okay bye-bye